In this video I will explain how the electric current is defined and how you can derive voltage scientifically correct from the electric charge and from some material properties of a conductor. And by the end of this video you will understand how current and voltage are connected by a simple equation and how Ohm's law, the famous Ohm's law, results almost automatically from this equation. And I will also show you what all of this has to do with Benjamin Franklin, the famous scientist, and why we have been struggling with a false sign in many of the basic equations in electronics for over 300 years because of him. My name is Andreas from the Fearless Engineer and here we go. In so many books and also here on YouTube, current and voltage are often explained with a so-called water model, which is basically a rough analogy that is supposed to help you develop a rough understanding of how electric circuits actually should work. Now the problem is that in many cases this water model does not fit, uh, fit very well to what's really happening in practice and you can reach a dead end if you follow it all the way through in your understanding rather quickly. And to prevent this from happening to you, I will show you in this video how current and voltage are defined and how they can be explained in a scientifically correct way. And as a byproduct, so to speak, the famous Ohm's law, the very Ohm's law, can be already glimpsed from the equations we get to by the end of this video. And we have already seen on the last video on the Coulomb force that there is a force effect between charge carriers that depends on the size and also on the relative distance of charges towards each other. And in order to power electronic devices, we have to make the electrons and the connecting cables between the terminals of a battery and also in the circuitry all move together into the same direction. And we can do this by creating a surplus of charge carriers on one side of the circuit and a deficit on the other side. And this then results in an electric field which sets the free electrons in between within the circuit into motion. And if you want to look into the Coulomb force more deeply before proceeding on this video, you can find the link to the corresponding video up here in the cards. And what we want to know now is what exactly this movement depends on, how many charge carriers move how fast and how energy can be supplied to a circuit by this movement. And in order to explain all of this, we will take a look at the definition of current as moving charge per time. We'll, we'll talk about the difference between electron flow direction and current direction. And we'll also explain the dependence of current on geometry, material and electric field. And we will also lastly define electric voltage as the amount of work performed on each charge. And near the end of the video, we will discover this relationship between current and voltage from which the basic form of the famous Ohm's law can already be glimpsed. And if you're interested, you can download all the slides you see, all the circuit diagrams I use in all my videos on my website at thefearlessengineer.com. And by the way, the video, this one here, is part of a basic course in electronics. And in case you're interested and you like this kind of videos, uh, you can find the corresponding playlist on my channel, also up here in the cards. And if you just feel like it, then also you might want to consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget, if you do so, to ring the bell, because then you know immediately when the next video goes online. Oh, and if you have any questions, if you don't understand something properly or you want to suggest something new a, new, a new topic for the course maybe, then just click pause, write me a comment down below in the comment section and I'm happy to help you. And now let's start with a scientifically sound definition of electric current and voltage. Have fun! Now in this module we will discuss current and voltage which are absolutely fundamental if you want to go anywhere in electronics. And as before I have split this module into two separate videos. The first, this one here, is about the theory behind electric current, voltage and also something called potential. And we will look deeply into the definition of these three key units in electronics. And in the second part, which is the next video, we will put your knowledge to the test and we will build our own battery from scratch, completely from scratch, using kitchen materials and also some scrap metal, which I found in my workshop. But now let's start with the electric current. If you have watched the last tutorial on charges in a wire, you already know how to calculate the number of free electrons in a circuit. And if you haven't watched it, the link is coming up now in the cards. And what we did in this video was to calculate the number of electrons passing through a piece of wire in a time period which we call TL. And the index L stands for the actual length of the wire. And this time TL, it had been defined in this previous video in a way such that it measured the amount of time it takes all the free electrons within this wire volume to drift from its beginning to its end. And by dividing the total amount of free charges, Q, by this time TL, we get a measure for the number of moving charges per time interval, which takes us already into this direction of a definition for the electric current, which we'll look at next. 
And in order to get there, we shrink the volume of the wire by decreasing the length of an almost infinitesimal value until we get to a very flat disk which covers the entire cross section of the wire but has almost no, no height, no length. And by measuring the number of charges, which we call delta Q, passing through this small disk for a small amount of time, delta T, we get to our definition of the electric current, which is the total charge that passes through this cross-sectional area of a conductor per time unit. And sometimes it's unclear to students just how long this delta T period has to be. And the answer for you now should be clear, because just as we have considered the entire wire in the previous step, where the time T was the time it took the electrons to move along all the entire length of the wire, um, delta T now is the time it takes them to pass through this almost infinitesimally flat volume you can see in the diagram here. And interestingly, you can place such a cross-sectional area anywhere you like, in a gas, in a liquid, any other medium where electrons move, you can place such a cross-sectional volume. It also doesn't have to be a circle. It can be any arbitrary surface. And as long as you count the number of charges passing through this volume in a given time, you will be able to calculate a value for the electric current. But before we move on to voltage, we have to discuss the direction of flow because this traditionally leads to some confusion. And the reason for this confusion can be found more than 300 years in the past, way, way back in the past, when the famous scientist Benjamin Franklin from the United States, when he pioneered electricity and conducted many groundbreaking experiments. But when he described the flow of charges, he was not aware of things such as electrons or protons or even the elementary charge, simply because they had not been discovered yet. And this is why he defined the flow of current as the movement of positive charges, not negative, positive charges. And this is why the entire foundation of electrical engineering, part of which he basically invented, has been built based on these false assumptions. And when electrons were discovered in the late 19th century and people realized the actual things moving were the electrons, negative charges, it was already too late to change all these, uh, these uh, things, th these basic things which had found their way into the literature of the time. And if you look at this very simple circuit here, you can see that the electron flow occurs from the negative towards the positive terminal of the battery, which is what we expect. The electrons move from the surplus to the deficit, which is at the positive side. But the current flow is described by Benjamin Franklin, which is the red arrow points into the opposite direction, which is why when we define flow directions, we use the current flow pointing from the positive to the negative terminal, even though we all know now that electrons actually move into the opposite direction. So, summing up everything, most of the formulas you will encounter in this course and in all the textbooks will pretend that the current is actually made up out of positive charges. Thanks a lot, Mr. Franklin. And now that we have found a definition for the electric current, let's take a look at the unit we measure it in. And as with many other quantities in physics and other disciplines, the unit of measurement of current was named after a very famous scientist, and in this case, he was called André-Marie Ampère, and he lived in France in the 18th and 19th century. And Ampère has made many fundamental discoveries, especially in the field of electrodynamics and also other areas of electricity. And we will probably see much more of him in future videos to come. And alternatively, we can also define current as Coulomb per second. Coulomb is the unit for the charge, which basically fits to our definition of current as charge per time interval, which we already looked at in the beginning of this, of this video. And before we move on, let's take a quick look at some typical values for currents that you find in household devices. On the left side, you can see a typical microwave oven, which draws about 5 amperes, or amps as we also call it. And in the middle, we have a 100 watt light bulb, which draws around half an amp at 230 volts in Germany, and a typical smartphone, which is around 200 more or less milliamps that is 0.2 amps. So between smartphones and microwaves, we have a factor of 25, which gives you a first idea of the range of currents you typically find in your household. But now that we have our definition of current as charge per time, let's discuss which properties of a circuit actually influence the flow of current. And in the last video on charges in a piece of wire, we have already found a definition for charge, which depends on the volume of the wire in terms of its cross-section area A, and also its length L, and on the free electron density, which we call Na. And if we insert this into our definition of current, we get the expression you can see here on the slide. And interestingly, the ratio of length and time can all also be interpreted as the speed or velocity of the electrons because the speed is basically defined as length per time and as the electrons move from beginning to end of a wire in a time t you can calculate from these two um, from these two units um, the uh, speed at which the electrons move let's investigate this a little bit more deeply 
Now if we take our equation from the previous slide and simply replace the ratio of wire length and time by a new expression which we call VD, which stands for the velocity with which electrons move or, or drift, this is why it's called VD, drift through the wire, we get the equation you can see here on the top of the slide. And we have already seen the drift velocity in the video on the Coulomb force and without going into further details here in this video, watch the other video if you want to know more, we can replace it by the product of the electron mobility and the electric field which we call E. And this expression tells us that the speed of electrons is dependent on the strength of the electric field and also on a material property of the conductor in which the electrons drift along. And on the bottom of the slide you can see a very interesting equation because it groups the different terms which make up the current into a number of different categories. And the current depends on geometrical properties, on material properties and also on the electric field which provides the energy to move the charges along. And energy is something which we have to discuss much more deeply before we move on into the next section of this course. Now one of the most basic tasks in engineering is to control the transport of energy to a place where work has to be performed as we wish it. And this holds for mechanical engineering as well as for electronics and many many other disciplines in engineering. So let's look at the notion of potential energy which you have surely heard about before in your physics classes. And if you look at the small diagram on the left you can see two apples hanging in the air and um, the gravitational field of the earth is acting on these apples. And the potential energy of both bodies is different as the position within this force field also differs. One apple is higher than the other one and therefore has a higher potential energy. So far so good. And when an apple falls off the tree, its potential energy, which it gets from its height and also from the gravitational pull of the, of the, of the G field, it is transformed into kinetic energy, which basically means speed. So the field describes the velocity which a body will gain or which it also will lose. And to sum this up, we can say that when we move a body to a lower position in field direction, it will lose some potential energy and gain some kinetic energy. And this is expressed very neatly in the two equations at the bottom of the slide here. The left one defines potential energy as the product of mass, gravity and relative height. And the right one defines kinetic energy as the product of mass and speed squared divided by two. And interestingly, the same conversion mechanism is happening inside electric circuits. We can describe the energy of an electric field very similarly to a gravitational field. The small diagram on the left illustrates what I mean. And similar to the apple, we can describe the potential energy of a charge in an electric field depending on its relative position in that field. So the charges moving in the circuit are subject to a similar mechanism as the apple falling from the tree. And we can therefore say that moving a charge against the electric field decreases its potential energy while at the same time it increases its kinetic energy. So this is the transport mechanism for energy into a circuit. We accelerate a large amount of charges and use their kinetic energy to power an electronic device. And one of the reasons why electronic devices often get so hot is that a part of the kinetic energy is spent on heating up the device due to friction between the electrons and the conductor material. And now we get to the meat of this slide here, which can be found in the equation at the bottom. When we move electrons to a new position down the wire, its potential energy is decreased, which can be described by an equation very similar to the potential energy of the apple you saw on the previous slide. And when we replace mass with charge and gravity with the electric field, it's a simple switching of the units here, we get this very simple product of Q and E and delta L. And this is what gives us our definition of voltage, which is nothing more than the change of potential energy of a charge between two positions in a circuit. So voltage is the product of relative length and electric field. And now let's look into this a little bit more deeply. As with current, the unit for voltage is named after a very famous scientist again, in this case the Italian physicist Alessandro Volta, and we measure it in volts. And now the major idea of, of this slide here is to give you an idea of what voltage actually is, and to understand this we need to recall the definition of the electric field from the video on the Coulomb force, where we defined E, the electric field, as the ratio between force and charge. And as voltage is the product between electric field and also relative length, we can define a volt in units of newton meter per charge, which can be understood as the amount of work per charge. So if you look at the battery, for example, its voltage rating tells you 9 volts, 1.5 volts. It tells you how much work it can perform on the charges it is able to move through a device. And we need to get into this a little bit more deeply on the next slide, but please stay with me here because it's really, really worth it. And it's the last slide in this video before we get to the summary. 
So now we have defined voltage as the product between electric field and relative length. And now we can simply insert this into our equation, which we have for the electric current. And in doing so, we get this very interesting equation, which you find at the bottom of the slide here, which has the current I on its left side, the voltage on the right side, and a number of material properties in between the two. And this is the equation which will give us Ohm's law later on, a linear relation between current and voltage, which is defined by this middle term, which represents the conductor material. But this is something for the next video to come. For now, let's sum it all up. So let's take a look at what we have learned so far. First of all, electric current is defined as the total charge that passes through a cross-sectional area of, for example, a, a wire per time unit. And secondly, due to a historic misconception caused by the famous scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin 300 years ago, we have to assume current flow from the positive to the negative terminal in many basic laws and formulas which we find all over the place in electronics. And also, thirdly, we have seen that the electric current depends on wire geometry, its material, as well as on the electric field propagating within it. And finally, we have defined voltage as the change in potential energy between two positions in a circuit. And we can use it to express the amount of work that can be performed per each charge. And in the upcoming hands-on tutorial, we will explore current and voltage a little bit further by building our own battery from coins, some scrap metal from my workshop, and some lemon juice from my kitchen. In this video we have discussed two very important basic parameters in electronics which are electric current and voltage and you now know that current refers to the amount of electrons moving through a conductor in a given time and that voltage tells us how much work can be performed on each electric charge. And you have also seen that there is a direct link between both current and voltage via the conductor material and also its geometrical shape which provides us with a very neat equation which is going to be the basis for Ohm's law. And in the next video we will look at how we actually can build our own battery totally from scratch with kitchen materials and workshop scrap metal and use it to light up an LED which is a small light bulb so to speak. And also I will show you how you can use something called a multimeter which is a device to measure the battery current and its voltage. And if you like this video please consider subscribing to my channel and in case you do don't forget to press the bell because then you know immediately when the next video goes online. And also you can find all the learning materials which I use in my videos, circuit diagrams, slides and the like at my website at thefearlessengineer.com. So have fun and see See you here next time on The Fearless Engineer.